I don't know. Yeah, I mean, compared to, to what it would have had before. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't have much. We, we, we've done some genetic testing on this herd, and our, our diversity is better than a lot of other herds. But. Like cheetahs went through a, right. a crisis like that, and it's really affected the right. animals. Right. Today, right? So uh, <laughs> since we traded, our herd has improved quite a bit. And before that, they had some issues with sickle hawk, things like that. Um, and we, we've done, we did those two initial trades. We, we got some animals from Kansas City once. They were wimps. They didn't last long. And we had traded some from Oklahoma in 2002. And I just sold the last one of those last year. She, so they really did well. We've got a lot of Oklahoma genes in our herd now. Did, when you did your genetic study, did you look for cow genes? I understand. Yes. Because it's not good. We, we looked for mitochondrial DNA. Mm -hmm. We didn't do nuclear. And we found a few animals with cattle mitochondrial DNA. And the interesting thing was that those with cattle mitochondrial DNA did really poorly. And they'd been culled just on our normal culling practices. Okay. Was it in trading strictly bulls that you were trading? No. Um, cows, mostly. Mostly cows? Mm -hmm. Yep. So we, the, the Fort Riley herd had a few steers. So we traded some steers for some young heifers from with the Smith family ranch. And I can't remember what the arrangement was with Maxwell, something similar. Um, we might have traded them some bulls for some heifers. I can't remember. I'd have to look at the old documents. Uh, we did get a couple bulls from uh, Bob Fry. That was our, our 2,000 pound bull. Our record winner was a Bob Fry bull. You, you that raised a good question, why cows versus bulls? Well, you can monitor the performance of a cow. You know if she's having babies or not. A bull, you can put him out there. But you don't know if he's breeding or not, unless you do genetic testing. So Fort Riley castrated some bulls? Mm -hmm. We had no use for steers here, so we traded them. Part of military training. Wrestle <laughs> 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 Yeah. yeah. All right, so uh, since that time, obviously the herd has grown. Um, we keep them stocked now with the idea that we want to remove 25% of annual forage production. So we basically take the acreage out there, minus whatever we think is too woody or too steep to graze, multiply that by the average plant production, and we come up with our grazing or stocking rate, which is 213 animal units for 213,000 pounds of bison on the prairie. So I have a question about that. Mm -hmm. Do you do you alter that animal unit number each year because of the expansion of the woody vegetation? We made an adjustment a few, you know, like six or seven years ago, but we haven't done one since. It probably needs to be done. So that animal unit, I can remember when they first got on here and I was talking to the department and yeah. about that and I was I was trying to figure out how do you determine that, and he said it was just based on typical Flint Hills production as opposed to the historic aspect of the impact of bison in Flint Hills since it was on the edge. Yeah, the issue with with trying to match what was historically here is that no one knows what was historically here. I think there's some interesting projects we could try altering some of these things. It's a matter of priorities and space and time. And what is an animal unit? 1,000 pounds. 1,000 pounds. So it, it's typically a mature female with a calf at her side as an animal unit. Now, yeah. modern cattle, lots of the breeds have, are now 1,200 pounds. For, if there are some that are 1,400 pounds. I don't know how practical that is on pasture. So you need to convert to a standardized unit. Animal, animal units is what we do. Now, our bison cows are <coughs> about 1,000 pounds, so that works pretty well. But we've also got bulls that weigh up to 1,800 pounds, and we've got a whole bunch of yearlings and calves that weigh a lot less. So it's a way for us to standardize our stocking rate while allowing flexibility in what age and sex classes we've got. So how many uh, acres per AU here? 11 and a half, 12. And that includes the woodies? Yes. And this is year-round grazing. And as you go further west, that would go up to 15 to 20. Oh, yeah. So yeah. yeah. The production is lower. So people are raising bison for meat. Uh, are they using different kind of management? 
Yeah, Stay yeah. Some people you. manage them just like cattle, put them on pasture in the summer, take them off and feed them in a lot in the winter. Some people do similar to what we do, leave them all the time. Other people do rotation and grazing. Some people raise them all in feedlots, just like a cow. So it's up to the producer to do what they want. We don't view ourselves as producers, yeah. but we are, whether we like or not. Because you're not trying to maximize productivity, you're just trying to figure out how they Right. I mean, we do structure the herd so that we've got a high number of breeding females rather than having a bunch of bulls. We don't keep a 50-50 sex ratio because it's a lot of bulls, a lot of fighting, and a lot of wasted grass. So we, we do some things, but we're not feeding or anything like that. But you're generating data that's like a rate of gain or something like that? Yeah, we have annual weight data, and we'll, we'll talk yeah. about that a little bit later. <clears throat> There's year-round grazing. They're on pasture all the time, except for a couple weeks around Roundup when we've got to have them in the corral. And they do not get any supplemental feed unless things are dire out there. We've got an inch of ice all over everything they just can't eat. So they lose weight in the wintertime. They lose about 10 to 11 percent weight loss from November to March or April. They'll usually start gaining weight again in the middle of April, about the time of the first calf drop. So this is our comes map. The <coughs> green in here. This is all the bison area. It's about 2,400 acres. It's got 10 watersheds, four burn treatments every year, every other year, the fourth year, or the 20th. So most years, except for the years we have a 20-year burn, you get four watersheds burned. And because of what I said before, foliar nitrogen, forage quality, they're going to spend time where we burn this year. So this year we're burning in 4C. The 4 year burn in 2A is our 2-year burn. They will spend a lot of time right here at least early in the season. They'll run over to N1B, check things out, hit these lawns and the way back, but they're going to be here a lot. The only fencing dividing the, the bison areas uh, along that line from... Yeah, so there's this perimeter fence, and then there's the phase one, phase two fence. So when they first built the fence, they built it in this inner portion from here to the west, it's phase one. This is all they had when the bison were first introduced. This outer portion of phase two, was opened in 1992. So when we start traveling to Roundup, we'll bring bison into phase one in late September, probably. So we step here and we'll bring them around. But yeah, that's the only interior fence and it's open most of the year. Would run the uh, pointer along the internal fence? Right here, between N1A and N4, and on the west side of N2B, up to this gate here. Okay. <clears throat> So, uh, if you want to know who an animal is, roughly, we have ear tags specific to each animal. The color will tell you the decade they were born in. <clears throat> so, yellow is the early 2000s, 2000, 2000 to 2009 are yellow tags. Orange is 2010 to 2019. Before that, we had white, and before that, we had blue. We don't have any of those left. So, the first digit in the ear tag number tells you the year she was born. So the yellow means the 2000s, 5 means 2005. So she was born in 2005. 01 just means she was the first calf of the one in that year. This one's orange. That's the 20 teens. 2014, that's the 4, 05, fifth calf of the line. I can't read it. 30-something, 2013. So if you want to impress people, you can tell them how old they are in that, just by looking through your tag. This is how our herd is structured. This is up to date. These are the animals that we know are out there. They haven't died. I don't think anybody's died yet. Um, so we maintain this the stocking rate and the sex ratio through selective culling at Roundup. We keep about 15 females, or five to six males per cohort. Those are typically the heaviest. We're assuming heavy means healthy. But they're performing well. We will sell males at seven year olds at seven years old, assuming they come in for roundup. Sometimes they don't like to do that. So sometimes we date or nine year olds after we try not to. Females, once they are mature at three years old, we expect them to have a calf at least once every other year. If they don't do that, then they're on the list. So this year you can see our oldest is seventeen years old. We're gonna have one seventeen, that's yellow one six six. She's blind, watch out for her. 
Um, and then we've got you know, a whole bunch of bulk calves, you know, calves. And we pair this down by the time they mature at three years old, we try to be down to our replacement heifer size. So why did we keep one six uh, She had a calf last year. So she's still producing? Yeah. I, I intend to sell her this year assuming she doesn't have a calf. I was going to get her get by as a blind animal. She's fine on pasture. You know, she can hear and she can smell. The issue is when she gets in close quarters with other animals or vehicles or in the corral. It can be difficult for her and for everybody else. So is that pink eye? I think she had a pink eye a long time ago in one eye, and that made it blind. And last year she had a really bad pop eye. So she, she, I think she can see light and shadow, but she can't distinguish much. But what's the cloud eye that when they get all white? And it seems to go away over the winter time, though. Uh, it's usually from pink eye. It can be from bacteria, or it can be from you know, getting an on grass seed in there, just irritation. So, so a document we have says that our male and female is a one to five point seven, and we're really not close to that on either mature, and certainly not on total herd. What is the best balance? Best is subjective, right? Well, right. <laughs> I mean. Uh, this is, our sex ratio is, it should be close to one to five if you're only counting on mature animals, so from three years old and older. Or we don't count these immature ones as, as breeding age. So, you know, conservation herds, people that run Yellowstone or Custer State Park or the National Bison Range would say you keep a 50-50 sex ratio so the males can compete. We don't do that. Uh, one to five. Yeah, I mean, if you're, you could probably go up to 1 to 15 and still get everybody bred, but we don't want to go that high. We do want to allow some competition and allow some diversity in that breeding goals. I noticed that calves continue to gain weight through <coughs> the other animals are losing weight. So are they nursing? Yes. It's nursing that makes sense. Yeah. So in, when do they stop nursing? Whenever their mom tells them to. <laughs> so I've seen a mother that had three calves in her own was nursing all three. Now typically the third calf there, the youngest one, is going to be small and be sold. And the first one probably be big and be a keeper, right? Because it's stealing up from the siblings. Right. But the, I meant during a calendar year. When does the female oh, stop lactating? Uh, lots of the ones, if the mom's going to kick them off, they'll stop in December, January. And at that point, she's just unable to make it. Even though she may still let the cat nurse, but the cat probably isn't getting anything. <clears throat> so to get all this done, we have to have a roundup. We can bring them all to the corral. They don't like it. We kind of like it. Uh, but it happens in late October, and bison are lured, not chased to the corral. So starting late September, we'll start going out in the trucks and offering protein pellets, range cubes, and we'll honk our horns and yell at them and give them treats. And they learn just like Pavlov's dogs to salivate when they hear the horn honking, and they and they'll follow us to the corral most of the time. Chasing them doesn't generally work. It gets stressful for us. It gets stressful for them. They hop over a rock ledge and go in the woods, and then the day is blown. So luring is much better. It tends to work pretty well. During roundup, we weigh animals, we sort them, we worm them, vaccinate the heifer calves for bangs, and ear tag everybody, uh, including an electronic RFID tag. Now, it takes two days typically. Day two, we're typically vaccinating and working the sale animal, getting blood work done. Anything that we're selling, we keep in the corral until the truck picks them up. Everything else goes out. Day two, when we're done with them. <coughs> so the purpose of the Kanza herd isn't to generate income, although it does, and it's an important source of income for Kanza. It's not to generate tourist activities, but that's what you guys are doing, more or less, right? Mm -hmm. It's to generate research opportunities. So these are the kinds of things we can do. We have here at Comp the longest continuous record of weight gain for native ungulates in the world. This is just an example of, of our data. This is calf weight, average calf weight over time. Our average is about 300 pounds. So you can see we have plenty of years below and plenty above. The last couple, us three, have been above average weights. Same thing with cow weights. We say our average is a little under 1,000 pounds. Last year was pretty good. Uh, that means I have I have hopes that we'll have above average calf numbers this year just based on that weight right there. We'll see. What happened in 2013? Uh, there was an issue with the scale. So we have data for 2013, but it's not good for comparing across years. You could use it to compare within the year, but I wouldn't trust it 
It looks like everybody lost 200 pounds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I mentioned the, the EID, electronic ear tags. <laughs> the little white buttons in their ears, if you see them here. Mm -hmm. um, what we can do now, besides making Roundup more, more easily accomplished, because we can electronically read the animal as it comes into the chute and have your information pop up, we also have a remote scale out on the top of uh, N4A. Mm -hmm. Into B, 4B up there. So we, can, okay. so we can track their weights throughout the year. This is just preliminary data from last year. And the, the red is dry cows, cows with no calf, and the blue is lactating cows. And you see that the, the dry cows obviously gain more weight. So this is the kind of thing that we could potentially do with this. I think it would be fun once the corral is done to capture a few new calves and put EIDs in them and watch calf weight gains through the years. So there's all sorts of opportunities there. Uh, we also keep track of calving rates. So this is our, our average calving rate, you know, number of calves per mature female. Our average rate is 63%. You can see some years are really good, some years are really bad. Mm -hmm. Last two years have been pretty good. I have hopes that to this year we'll get to average at least. We'll see. How did you choose where to locate that gate out in the field, the, the that, scale out in the field? That's the gate that they use a lot. And it's a funneling point that they have to go through. They like to go in that area. They, there's a lot of grazing along in N4A. So they spend some time over there. Even if it hasn't been burned, they go through it. And it's they sort of travel that upland fence around between phase one and phase two. So even if they've been down in N2 or down at the corral getting mineral, they tend to come up along that fence. So they're back and forth through a lot. It's just a place that gets a lot of traffic. Yes, though? Yeah, you don't get a push button. I'll push the button. <laughs> so, so does that calving rate correlate with rainfall? It would be previous year's rainfall, if anything. I, I haven't seen, I haven't done any analysis on it. It would be fun. I done it. So it would be previous year's rainfall, probably related to previous year's calving rate. So how many females are going to be in good condition? I don't know how much winter severity makes a difference. Bison are pretty hardy when it comes to cold temperatures. It doesn't bother them. They're starving anyway in the wintertime. So I don't know. It would be fun to look at. Mm -hmm. How successful are you in matching cows and calves during uh, Roundup and taking them through the chute? So taking them through the chute, we don't even try. Uh, once they are through the chute, uh, we keep them in the, in the big part of the corral out south, and the calves go out and they'll find their moms again, and the calves will have ear tags at that point. So usually after Roundup's all done, Friday afternoon, I go out in the corral and match them up. And usually it's not a problem. I just got to spend a couple hours driving around out there. So I keep track of that too. So there, this is calving rate uh, as it relates to the mother's age. You can see we have had, I think, three calves in history of Kanza born to two year old mothers. Most of them come three year old mothers and they, they stay relatively steady. There's some bouncing around. Uh, and then once they get over 10 years old, their calving rate tends to drop off pretty quickly. They're too old. It's hard for them to keep up with the metabolic requirements. Uh, so this is maternal contributions. This is the you know, portion of calves born to what age mother. Most of our calves come from young mothers. It makes sense because we just saw that young mothers are better at calving. And also, if you look at the herd structure, we have a lot more younger females in the herd than we do old females. Here's cat weight related to mother age. So you get the same story. Nice heavy cats, between three and ten years old, they start to get light as the females get older. These big jumps are probably just due to exceptional calves from one or two females. So the best calves are typically going to six to eight year old mothers. We've also done genetic testing. We talked about that in relates to finding cattle genes. But with, it, with genetic testing, we can also see who the fathers are, which bulls are doing the work. And you'll see uh, most of the work is done by the older males, starting around five years old. And within those age classes, there's typically one or two dominant bulls that are the biggest and strongest or the feistiest, most willing to work hard to get the job done. Some of these guys. Probably just not worth the record. <laughs> so, so there, uh, even though we have five to seven bulls out there for age class, not all of them are very successful. Some of them are very successful, others are not. And they will be. Comes to late July, you come out here on a quiet morning, you can hear them bellowing and fighting. 
sometimes they push each other through the fence and there'd be a bull wandering around outside of the fence trying to find a way back in. Uh, we've also done some diet work. So uh, this is crude protein as estimated with fecal samples. Now, the maintenance level, the amount of protein that is generally considered to be needed for an animal to maintain its weight is 60 milligrams per gram. And you can see we've only got about 100 days where protein is high, high enough for them to not lose weight or just slightly gain weight for 100 days. The other 265 days a year forage is bad enough that a bison will lose weight. So they've got, a, they've, they've got it pretty tough out there, but they do a good job. And that's beginning in mid-April? That's beginning in mid-April. If you look at the, the remote scale data, the bison typically start gaining weight in middle April. You know, if, if we have a cold spring and the grass the sedges don't start growing soon enough, it could be later. And if that happens, usually the following year, you have calves later in the year. Because the animal wasn't able to gain condition soon enough to breed early. Um, we, there's also been some other work. This is <coughs> taking chloroplast genes from fecal samples to see plant, yeah, plant chloroplast genes to see what plants the bison are eating. We've also shown that bison aren't restricted to grass. They will supplement their diet with other forbs. So this graph is kind of hard to understand. This, this relative abundance of chloroplasts from different plant groups over on this axis, this is day of year. Now you can't, because this is a wide area, you can't just say that they're eating that much of a certain plant. It's relative across the year. So they're eating more day 150 or day 225. So that's less Lespediza. They're eating less Lespediza. This is New Jersey tea. They eat New Jersey tea early and late. Uh, this is mimosa. They eat mimosa in the summer. Cat claw sensitive bar. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So even though grass forage, yeah, sorry, I, <laughs> my mind works in lab. I know. I got to translate. Uh, so even though grass forage quality can be low, certain times of the year they they can supplement their diet with other forbs and other other plant types in order to get a little bit more protein. That's no problem for a ruminant. You can feed them straw, and as long as you give them nitrogen supplement, they can digest it and be okay. So they're doing that themselves. So in absolute terms, how much of their diet is made up from these We don't sources? know. That, that's a hard thing to get at with this kind of study. You have to come up with a different method. That would be a fun thing to do, I think. So the Lespedeza, was that wrong-headed bush clover? Uh, that was, so they have separate groups for violacea. This is violacea. The short one looks like a clover, an actual clover. And then the, this one up here is round headed bush clover. But like I said, these, you know, just because it's, this means that they found more chloroplasts in the dung. That could be because more chloroplasts get digested on bush clover than they do. So you're looking across years, you're not looking across taxa. I'm just saying it shows up in their diet. I just said, they just, they all know round-headed bush clover. That's yeah. the one plant okay. everybody knows. Okay. So they, <laughs> yeah. they do eat legumes? Uh-huh. Not necessarily a lot, but they'll supplement their diet with legumes out there. Because isn't that the biggest? That's this one here. What's this one? And this one is uh, violet lespedeza. It's a low-growing thing, looks like a clover. How many of these are nitrogen fixers? Well, there's some debate as to whether any of our nitrogen fixing legumes actually fix nitrogen here. Really? But the Lespedeza's would be. Okay. Now, that's not my area of expertise. You can argue some. Yeah, they don't that. have. They don't have. <laughs> yeah. They don't have nodules. Okay. Uh, and so I'm not going to talk about a bunch of other stuff. We've, we've done a bunch of other stuff. They put GPS collars on dominant females to watch where they spend time, and found that spend time where it's been burned recently, where forage quality is high but that that relationship breaks down later in the year when it dries up and forage becomes less available. Uh, they've looked at, you know, on an individual basis, how a bison spends its time eating, how it decides what bite to take, how fast to eat, that kind of thing. They looked at water sources and found that a bison is just as happy drinking out of a mucky wallet that's been pooped in, as they are they're more happy doing that than having to walk all the way down to the creek and drink. And a cow wouldn't, wouldn't touch that stuff. You know? uh, and there's plenty of other things they do from things directly on bison to the fact that having bison here makes LTER able to look at the difference between grazing and not grazing, bison grazing and cattle grazing. So their presence here is extremely important to the research program. 
and it's fun. Bison are cool. So. That's all I've got, unless you have more questions. I've heard on, on bison wallows that the, they use that as a mailbox, that the males urinate in there, kind of roll in and say, oh, no, it's they do. and call in the cow, bring the cows. Yeah, they can, and, and to signal each other. You know, lots of times, especially, I guess I notice it more around it when I'm trying to bring these bulls in, you get a bull following you. And the cows, they get hooked on cues and they'll run a half mile to see you. The bulls, they're mosey. You'll see it's a tree or a fence post, and you go scratch on it. You'll see a wall, and you'll go pee in it and roll in it. Especially if he comes up on a cow calf herd or another bull, he'll spend some time in the wall up. But it is, yeah, it's a communication thing as well as uh, pest control or whatever else they do in there. Mm -hmm. And you said the, the mice do eat close to ground, but that didn't have any major impact. It means it's slightly more forby, mm -hmm. slightly more forced. Um, I mean, oh, yes, and bison will create a more extensive grazing lawn. The vegetation will be shorter and weedier, whatever you want to call weed. But overall, you get the same effect with cattle. It's just that it's not quite as intense with cattle. Yes? So the cattle don't fill the wall of the no. no. So from a diversity standpoint on top of the hill, that's really creating an entire different habitat. It is, yeah. Mm -hmm. May not have anything to do with production as far as human interest. Is, sure, but sure. Certainly, otherwise. Right. If you outside the bison fence, there are wallows out there having bison for 200 years. Uh -huh. But they still have an ecosystem that's different than the rest they of them. They do. They do. There's a, a rare plant that I found on Kanza that grows in relic wallows. Walls haven't been used in 200 years, but they still fill up with water in the spring and create habitat that's different than anything else. And they still get frogs. Yeah. Okay. Which plant is it? A uh, tiny mouse tail, Myos, Myosiris minimus. It's, a, it's, a, it's related to buttercups, it's not that big. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I figured it might be. Do you get any eutropularia like, up there at all? I haven't seen it. Okay. It would be fun though, to see it on the end. Thanks, Jeff. Sure. <laughs> Two things. We've got this recorded. We had a lot of information, and so this will be one of the one of the things you can see on the YouTube channel or on the commentary channel on YouTube. Um, the his slides will be there too. The, the whole presentation. And do you mind leaving me a copy of the presentation, and then I'll I'll have his PowerPoints available too. Awesome. Um, that was, that was great. Lots of information. Yeah. And, and secondly, can you guys come with us? As long as we're back by noon. Yeah. Okay. So he'll come with us and we'll do a bicycle tour and you can ask him lots of questions out there on the tour. So let's take a break. Let's take a 10 minute break. It's 10 20. And let's